Hey gang, Dr. B here. I thought I'd share some thoughts on the election inspired by Aristotle. Um, I know we're in this kind of weird limbo period of uncertainty. We're all anxiously awaiting um, to learn the results of the presidential election, right? We're like, come on, Georgia and Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Arizona and Nevada, count those ballots faster, right? Um, so we're all in this kind of weird moment. Um, and we're reading Aristotle this week. And I thought that Aristotle actually um, can give us some perspective on this, this trial that we're all enduring, this experience that we're all sharing together, regardless, right, of which candidate we're rooting for, or what outcome we're hoping for. Um, I think Aristotle can um, give, like I said, give us some perspective on this, this moment. So um, I'm thinking in book three, which was part of your assigned reading for this week, Aristotle um, and th this actually will help you with your assignment this week, your Flipgrid assignment, because this is a big difference between Aristotle and Plato. And I think what I asked you to do was identify differences between Aristotle and his teacher. But, you know, the point that makes that Aristotle makes here in book three um, is that democracy is not as bad as thinkers like Plato have made it out to be. He actually gives us a little defense of democracy. Um, it's not the most uh, stirring uh, emphatic defense, right? He's, he still doesn't think it's, it's the best form of government, um, but he thinks it's not an entirely altogether bad one. And I thought it would be helpful, like I said, during this very tense, excruciating moment of kind of civic uncertainty for us to, to hear what Aristotle thinks is good about democracy. So um, the first point he makes is that well, there's this difference between a good man and a good citizen, and you can't expect, you know, every good citizen to also be a virtuous good person. Um, so then the question becomes, how do you form a government out of people who, and individuals who may not be themselves virtuous, right? So democracy, he thinks, is actually pretty good at solving this problem that virtue and a citizen and virtue in an individual and in a man are not necessarily the same thing. Because what democracy does is it pools individuals together. And Aristotle thinks that even though individually each citizen might not be good, together um, they can come together as a collective and they can actually bring about a better, more just outcome than they would just acting individually. So here's what he says. For the many of whom each individual is not a good man, when they meet together may be better than the few good, if regarded not individually, but collectively. Just as a feast to which many contribute is better than a dinner provided out of a single purse. For each individual among the many has a share of excellence or virtue or practical wisdom, and when they meet together, just as they become in a manner one man who has many feet and hands and senses, so too with regard to their character and thought. Hence the many are better judges than a single man of music and poetry, for some understand one part and some another, and among them they understand the whole. There is a similar combination of qualities in good men who differ from any individual of the many, as the beautiful are said to differ from those who are not beautiful. Anyway, he goes on and on. I think you see the point, though, that he's making there, that we may be poor judges individually, but collectively, when we kind of pool our, our faculties and our share of virtue and wisdom, we can actually arrive collectively at a better decision than, than each of us could individually. So, like I said, it's, it's a little heartening to be reminded of right now that this whole exercise, excruciating though it may be in democracy that we're undergoing, may actually end up producing a better outcome than if, say, you know, Professor Bracewell had just been permitted to, to choose, you know, who should be in the Senate and who should fill the office of the presidency, right? Um, one other aspect of Aristotle's, um, like I said, uh, kind of lukewarm 
uh, defense of democracy that I've been thinking a lot about today in this moment. Um, it starts on, on page 76. This is in book three, part 11, just below the portion I had read before. He says, um, so, okay, some people say, all right, well, what you're saying about kind of collectively pooling the share of virtue and wisdom in the many to form some sort of unity that might itself arrive at a better judgment, there's something to that, but there's still a danger in allowing the many um, to have a share in great offices of the state because their folly is going to lead them into error and their dishonesty is going to lead to corruption, their lack of virtue if they're given so so much power, right, to actually share in the offices of the state. Um, this is going to lead to all sorts of problems. But then Aristotle says, but you know, there's a danger in excluding the many from a share in office. He says, for a state in which many poor men are excluded from office will necessarily be full of enemies. The only way of escape is to assign to them some deliberative and judicial functions. And this is why Solon, the great lawmaker in Athenian history, um, saw to it that um, the many would have some voice in electing magistrates and, and yada, yada, yada. So like I said, I think it's important to bear in mind in a moment like this, um, where maybe we're feeling uh, some resentment toward our fellow citizens who are also participating in this big project of sort of collective judgment that we're undergoing, um, where we're maybe feeling a little frustration, right? That those morons who support a different candidate than me or who think differently than me, they shouldn't even have a say in this process. What are they doing? They're so misinformed. They're so deluded, right? Um, I think what Aristotle is saying here is, is worth remembering that there is a danger in that that impulse to sort of deprive your equals, your fellows, of a share in office, because what that exclusion does is breed enmity and hostility and mistrust and division, and that once that has sort of crept into the fabric of the polis, um, you've you've really lost. You've really lost. The, the good um, that the polis can provide us, um, which is the possibility for a fully human and flourishing life, as Aristotle reminds us, right, in, in early in book one. He says that um, man is by nature a political animal and that the end of political society, of, of, uh, of political life together in a, in a community, in a polis, is not mere life. It's not survival. It's not protection. Um, it's not commercial gain. It is uh, virtue and, and goodness, right? Aristotle really believes that it's only possible to live a fully human life when you are living together in a community, um, in, in, a, in a polis, right? Um, so, so anyway, I think that that's worth remembering that this really, really unsettling, difficult, trying enterprise that we are in the midst of um, from Aristotle's perspective is something that is really, really valuable and, and worth cherishing and worth um, some of the anxiety and lack of sleep and, and heartache um, because he does think that it, it affords us opportunities to realize potentialities within us that we would not be afforded if we were, if we were outside of um, political community. So anyway, uh, those are just some thoughts I had uh, I hope that they help you understand Aristotle and appreciate Aristotle um, a little better. And maybe they even offered you some solace, some comfort um, on today, which I, I acknowledge is a really, really difficult day for, for many people. Um, all right. I look forward to seeing your discussion board posts for this week. Bye.